do have uh, lots of time for questions, so please raise your hand and Jeremy will bring the microphone to you. This is for Mr. Kempton. Um, does your organization work nationwide? We have patients in almost every state, but no, we, uh, our employers that we do business with are based primarily in Oklahoma and Texas. We are not a large company. I have almost, I have about 45 employees, if that gives you any, any idea. We're not a big player, but we're a good one. Uh, two questions. Um, I can't stay to go to the surgical center today. Do you ever have visitors, other physicians come in at other times if they call ahead? Yes. Um, not between now and the end of the year. No. Nope. <laughs> um, but absolutely. With a heads up, I'm Typically, I'll mark some time out and buy you lunch. And you know? the other thing is I had torn a muscle biceps, and I, I couldn't make it out here to the Surgical Center of Oklahoma because I couldn't have someone come. I only had a two-week window. But I, when I showed my friends the price online <coughs> versus the price at the local hospital, well, not the local hospital, but the medical center hospital, Yours was six thousand two hundred and two dollars, or six thousand two hundred. Theirs six, was six thousand two hundred and sixty. Okay, you impri you increase it, but nonetheless, theirs no, was <laughs> between fourteen and thirty thousand for the hospital fee. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'll take fourteen. They said, No, you can't choose. And I said, Well, I don't want to sue you. So, see you so. Thank you. Yeah, come out any time. Not, but not any time. Not between now and the end of the year. And if you please stand when you ask your question, please. Twilight Library Citizens Council for Health Freedom. Thank you so much for that lovely presentation. Will you just explain to me, because I do have some people who call our organization and they ask questions about the surgical center and they'll say uh, about Medicare. So just explain to all of us, you know, your relationship with Medicare patients and Medicare. Well, I, I stopped taking Medicare money as an anesthesiologist long before we opened the Surgery Center of Oklahoma and I just treated those patients free. I didn't file claims. I just treated them. And some of them paid me. Uh, most were angry and um, told me they, didn't, they were not a charity case. Um, but we still see Medicare patients at the Surgery Center of Oklahoma. I just tell them to leave Darth Vader in the car. Um, but we, the Surgery Center of Oklahoma accepts no federal money um, most of the patients that I see are um, folks who are managed pretty well with an epidural steroid injection once every year or two years that keeps them out of the operating room. And they've experienced the lack of care at other facilities that they didn't care for. And so they would show up and my website price for an epidural steroid injection for my fee and the facility is $700. In a lot of places it's three or 4000 So. They'll come in and it's seven hundred dollars, and if they don't have seven hundred dollars, I don't care. I mean, we just do it, um, and some of them do, and some don't. So that's how we treat them. I mean, you know, I, I shouldn't be here. I mean, all we've done is say, here's what we do, and here's how much it is. And then if somebody can't do that, we look them in the eye as their, as as our patient, and we do we work something out. I mean, my great uncle was the only physician in Chickasha, Oklahoma, just southwest of here. This is how he practiced medicine. I mean, this is exactly how he practiced medicine. So this is a, this is a real, real throwback. Two, two things you all need to know. If you've ever heard me say that a physician cannot be ethically the medical advocate of their patient without also being their financial advocate, that is his quote. That's Chris Paskowski. You cannot, you cannot be claim to be somebody's advocate medically while you participate in their bankruptcy, and that, that's a part of part of what we've all embraced. And the other thing y'all need to know about Chris, the I think the strongest anti-MOC language in the country is here in Oklahoma legislation, and he got that passed. He no, he did all that. No, no. That was you. That was that was in Tulsa. That was uh, Dr. Siegler who got that. I, I came to it late on that, so I. The uh, county, Cleveland County Medical uh, 
Society's president last year, and my uh, mission was MOC uh, against them, uh, against Mock, as I've learned about it and read the Newsweek articles. And uh, so I wrote a, uh, got a uh, uh, legislation or a, a referendum from AAPS and sent it into the State Medical Association. They said, well, Tulsa has already submitted this. Would you like to sign on with them? And I'm like, oh, well, yeah, sure. So, and then we were having the state meeting in April when it passed and Governor Fallon signed that law. And so I came late to it, but I was in full support of it. And uh, the OSMA did pass a referendum supporting National Board of Physicians and Surgeons. Um, our Surgeon Center of Oklahoma accepts that explicitly. Um, the Oklahoma Heart Hospital accepts NBPAS uh, uh, certification. I am trying to change Norman Regional Hospital. Integris Hospital, which is a large hospital here in Oklahoma, accepts it now. They've changed their bylaws to accept NBPAS. Um, there was a question earlier in this week, why is NBPAS only good for two years? And that's because it's based on continuing medical education, um, CME hours. Oklahoma, we have to have 25 hours per year to maintain our license. Um, NBPAS is 30 hours per year, or oh, it's actually 60 hours every two years, or 50 hours every two years. And, but if you have if your certification has lapsed, you have to have 100 hours of CME in your specialty in order to get board certified with, with them. Um, so that's why they want you doing your, they want to verify that you've done your CME every two years. And I actually had to mail in my certificates to them, um, whereas here at the state level of state license, you just check a box attesting that you, and then you're supposed to hold on to your certificates in case you get audited. I don't know anyone that's ever been audited by the state board for their CME. Um, but that's how the NBA, why the NBPAS is only two years, is to make sure you're doing your CME. Because they have, their commitment is to lifelong learning, just not through the maintenance of certification and the onerous ABMS system, so. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, Todd Kiefer. Uh, I'm just an advocate. Some of you probably know me from Twitter, <coughs> Free Market Monkey on Twitter, uh, freemarketmonkey.com, my blog. I cannot tell you how how lucky, how fortunate I am, I need to tell this story. Um, it just so happens that in my county, in uh, York, Pennsylvania, uh, I, in 2014, I was aware that a, a physician-owned orthopedic surgery center had the intentions to emulate Surgery Center of Oklahoma. And I went to the um, FMMA's uh, second annual meeting uh, last year, and I, I learned about how this direct contracting with self-funded employers is just really taking off. And I just, I understood the, the significance of it. And I went back and I got a hold of one of our, one of the surgeons from this uh, surgery center. And I went and I looked at their website and I, nothing had changed. And, and I said, and I got a hold of Dr. Pandelitis and I said, Nick, Nick, what's going on? I know you guys want to emulate what Surgery Center of Oklahoma is doing, but nothing's changed. I don't see cash prices. I don't see anything different. And he got back to me and he said, well, well, we're having trouble figuring out how to set our pricing and so forth. Maybe we could get together and talk about this. And I said, absolutely not. I am not who you need to talk to. You need to talk to Dr. Keith Smith. So I connected the two by email. And a couple of months went by, and the communication started going back and forth, and then plans started being laid. Uh, the third Wednesday of May of this year, uh, OSS Health posted their cash prices online. Uh, yeah, since that time, they have gotten uh, an independent urology practice and an independent gastrointestinal practice to go in on this uh, we have a meeting scheduled uh, October the 14th in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania to roll out uh, the opportunity to self-funded employers in our area, uh, this opportunity to uh, uh, direct contract with these fine facilities. So, uh, and I must mention, these guys, and it's going to be done right because these guys were so gracious in mentoring our local people and helping them get this thing going, I just know we're going to be successful. I'm uh, Ken Christman. I'm a plastic surgeon in Dayton, Ohio. And I've had unbounded admiration for Keith Smith for a long, long time. What he's done is amazing. And it should be replicated all over the country. 
Uh, unfortunately, I don't think it can be because of the intense hatred that the nonprofits have for institutions like, like his. It's horrible, but they are doing physicians so much harm uh, because you know they, they, they will not allow institutions in most places around the country like Keith's to survive. And they have a lot of political clout and they have a lot of capital. Uh, I'm also a huge advocate of uh, cutting out the insurance companies. Uh, but uh, let me just ask you a question, uh, Mr. Kempton. Uh, is what you're doing through the ERISA law, is this federal law uh, with the third party administrators and, and the self funded uh, groups? Yes. Okay. Um, I would just uh, suggest this as a caution to some and my situation may be unique, but I've done extensive maxillofacial trauma for 35 years. And a few years ago, I had uh, the absolute worst case that I've ever seen in my life. And I doubt that this kid, I, I know he should have died by all standards. Just about every bone in his face was crushed. And uh, I've never seen anybody with this kind of injury survive. And uh, his mother actually worked for a hospital in another state, and he was helicoptered in to where I was. And uh, the uh, ERISA law was uh, something that the uh, self-funded hospital hid behind because they felt that they could do whatever they wanted to. And they called his treatment, which was multiple, multiple surgeries, probably 20, 22, 24, something like that. It was expensive, okay? There was a lot of work done. This guy almost died. And uh, they said it was all experimental because they didn't want to pay for it. They wanted to get him out of the hospital as, as soon as they possibly. This was another hospital. This was another hospital where he was at because the somewhat rural hospital in the other state just didn't want to pay for it all. So they called it experimental. And then they hid behind ERISA law. And uh, then we ultimately had to file a lawsuit against them uh, because they were just refusing to pay. They were just looking for any reason to refuse to pay. When, when, when you're, um, you say the hospital was doing this? this? This was the hospital that the patient's mother worked at. Okay, so they had a self-funded program and there, through their third party administrators and everyone else, they were hiding behind the ERISA law, which makes it very, very difficult to take them to court. And so what I'm suggesting is that instead of this being under ERISA law, all insurance, all other insurance is all under state law. And so under state law, the Department of Insurance then has jurisdiction over these insurance companies, and at least they, they can do something about it. But under federal law, they ignore it. As a matter of fact, so much so that uh, the, uh, this self-funded hospital, through its attorneys, actually threatened uh, me and saying that if I did not win this case, that they would come after me personally. And, uh, and they mean it. You know, they're, they're very, very aggressive because the federal law allows them to get away with all of this. So what I'm suggesting is the federal government, when anything gets involved in the federal government, you know, they make a mess of things. Look at what our uh, Medicare situation is like. With other insurance companies, you either participate or you don't. But with Medicare, what do you have? You have non-participating, you have opted out, you have disenrolled, you have, you have a whole system out there that is just crazy. And so what I would suggest is that all of this ought to be, un, you know, we can't accept Medicare and what they're doing and how they're defining all of this. We also can't accept, I, in my opinion, you know, the federal law getting involved in insurance in a situation like this, and maybe it all ought to be under state law, and I don't know how you would feel about that. Uh, I'll, I'll definitely comment on that because we do, we hear that a lot. Um, it, it sounds like to me you had a bad actor, um, and that hospital was a, a bad actor, and they did stand behind ERISA. ERISA is not a bad law. In fact, ERISA is probably the best consumer protection, patient protection law that has ever existed. Because, you know, ERISA, the, the main standards behind ERISA is that plan assets are used for the exclusive benefit of the beneficiaries. Can't be, I, I can't take that money and go buy a vacation home with it. Dr. Smith can't do that either as a self-funded uh, plan sponsor. 
Um, but this is where I think this is where I think this this bad actor was hiding behind ERISA. Is there's another provision within ERISA that states that the funds of a self-funded plan can only be used for reasonable expenses and to defray reasonable administrative expenses. And again, bad actors, whether they be employers, in this situation it was an employer, just happened to be a hospital, it sounds like, um, did use ERISA to actually reduce, it sounds like, the benefits available to that beneficiary. Um, I don't have any employers that operate like that, and if I did, they probably wouldn't be one of my customers for very long. Um, and you know, Dr. Smith, if if he had a, uh, if there was an employer that played those kind of games, he'd just say, you know, I don't sell to you anymore. Isn't that why you buy reinsurance? It is why you buy reinsurance, yeah. But uh, I, I do, I hate it when, when uh, you know, bad actions get blamed. So, oh, well, ERISA enabled that. Well, I think it's a misapplication of ERISA that enabled that. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael Robb, Otoneurology, Phoenix, Arizona. Question regarding off-label surgical interventions. May we refer patients to you for cochlear implant, vagal nerve stimulator, and other same-day surgery procedures that would be considered off-label for suppression of tinnitus, for example? And could you get a discount on the cochlear implant device, as well as offering them a great professional fee and facility fee, and then we would follow them up in a different state? Yeah, we, we have part, I'm not, a, I don't do cochlear implants. We have otologists, uh, three or four, that do do cochlear implants. Um, it's, as far I know, it's, it's about $30,000, and that includes the cost of the implant, or it's $6,000 plus the implant, and... It's $8,500 plus the cost of the implant, which varies because they're more in the companies. It's $8,500 plus the cost of the implant, which I don't include in our price because the companies that make those are warring you know, it's nice to pit them against each other and then you wind up with a better price. So, um, yes, if you, if you want to refer someone in order to spare them bankruptcy for the, to, and to benefit from our pricing and are willing to follow them up locally following implantation of cochlear implant or whatever, we would be thrilled to be in a, uh, a relationship and an arrangement like that with you. What I would prefer is that you approach a facility where you're comfortable working and say, if you don't match this, they're going to Oklahoma City. And, and then we help you with that, because that makes more sense. Absolutely. Hi, uh, Michael Reesberg, ENT, Pensacola, Florida. A uh, question for Dr. Smith. I know um, one of the advantages besides efficiency that was just mentioned in outpatient surgical facilities is that reimbursement tends to value the physician and the surgeon and anesthesiologist more for the value of his time. Uh, how do you normally uh, do that? I know much of it is a cash basis. I've um, unfortunately never been privy to being able to work in a facility where they do have transparency in the pricing. Since it's not reimbursed from insurance, do you normally have an agreed upon fee schedule among the surgeons or the physicians, or is it purely a dividend for the owners as their benefit uh, from doing surgery there? Well, it's, it's both. I think you're asking two questions. How are the profits distributed from our facility, but also how did we come up with our bundled pricing? Who gets what? Is that? So, I love this question. So, to determine how much Chris Paskowski should be paid by a patient for a tonsillectomy, I determined a radical course to get that answer. I asked him, how much do you want? <laughs> what is your time worth? And I think we did this with four or five guys in the room. I took a select group of our surgeons um, and how much do you want? And I mean, Chris is smart, but a lot of the guys didn't know. They had no idea. And my response then, well, you're either tired of somebody else telling you what you're worth or you're not. You know, 
you need to give me you need to give me the number i don't want to be the central planner <laughs> i don't want to impose it on you you tell me what it is and in every single case the prices were way too low they what i was being, what i was hearing was shocking frankly so i think without exception every single price that a surgeon told me was acceptable that would feel like a mutually beneficial exchange I padded. So in control and owner and owning our facility, we've taken the institutional charge, which, which is where most of the bankruptcy uh, comes from in healthcare, and we did this. So we, we took the institutional charge that traditionally had generated real profits for the Surgery Center of Oklahoma, and we did this. We just ratcheted it down. We have a marginal profit, but it's not large. It's, it's a base hit, not a grand slam. And we give a fat fee, is that fair? Yeah. To the surgeon, the, guy, you know, the guys and girls doing the work. As anesthesiologist, I'm paid for my time. It's time and materials. The beauty of that is that when I email Chris Paskowski or any of the other surgeons that work at our facility and I say, hey, I've got a patient from Wisconsin or Alaska or Texas that needs whatever, they're on it. I mean, that patient goes to the head of the class and so the, the, the patient feels it. I mean, the patient gets a call from the surgeon and they feel that red carpet sort of thing. So that's how we came up with our pricing. And then our, our partnership agreement works like a law firm. So since we do not accept federal money, we can actually operate like a business. So we distribute profits based uh, essentially like a law firm does. So we, we have time for two more brief questions. Let me just, he, Keith lowered the price of tonsillectomy from 3,600 to 3,100 all inclusive. And I saw that and he put it on his blog and I was like, Keith, would you talk to us the next time you do that? <laughs> and he said, oh, don't worry. We took it out of the surgery centers, the facility fee. I was like, oh, well, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dennis Rivero, Orthopedics, uh, Oklahoma, Muskogee, Oklahoma. Uh, one of my concerns as a patient, and uh, fortunately I've been in fairly good health throughout my life, but is uh, catastrophic uh, events. And when you talk about self-funding, you know, that's great if people just need a scope here and a this and a that, but if you finally have uh, one of your employees has some catastrophic event, I mean, that can really, I would think, cause great problems. And personally, you know, I would be more than happy to just have some kind of catastrophic plan and pay everybody in cash. I, I, my question really is, like, how do you handle or worry about, you know, the possible catastrophic events when you're self-funded? Yeah, um, this is probably my bad. I, I was a little lazy with my lexicon. Um, anytime I say the word self-funding, <laughs> The vast, vast majority of the time that should you should hear partial self-funding, because almost every single one of my clients, with only one exception, buys a very comprehensive reinsurance policy that has various levels of risk retention um, for the employer. Smaller employers will maybe have a, a thirty thousand dollar per patient uh, deductible while a large employer, our largest group, has $250,000 worth of retention uh, before the reinsurance carrier kicks in. And so th that is how the, the risk is mitigated for the self-funded employer. Okay, this is a really quick question. Um, what's your count of how many other centers uh, and facilities you've inspired so far? Well, I, I'm aware of as a as a facilitator um right over 50. now there are more um, but it's growing and actually uh, soon on the fmma.org website we will hopefully have a very comprehensive listing of all of them that are that we are aware of and most of them have been inspired by dr smith final question up in Wisconsin, a patient who had a hysterectomy got a surcharge of $65,000 for, for robotic surgery. And I was wondering if you have robotic surgery and if you have a sur surcharge for that. Oh, this is fun. So I do not have a robot, but our website has enough penetrance that 
we get requests for robotic hysterectomies or somebody will come in that wants a hysterectomy but their uterus is the size of a medicine ball and they've got to have a robotic procedure. So I don't have a robot. So I contacted a hospital in town that had a robot that's underutilized and said, will, will you give me prices for a robotic hysterectomy? And they thought about it for a minute and said, sure. So I said, well, this is great pricing. You need to put this out where everybody could see it because I'm <laughs> being asked, you know, for all these procedures. And they said, <coughs> no, our lawyers have told us that we can't post prices because it will conflict with contracts that we have with the federal government and other carriers. So I put their prices on my website. <laughs> <laughs> and so when you go through our website, if you're inclined, you will find procedure pricing there, not just for Deaconess Hospital, but for other facilities in this area that are not my facility. And I post their prices. And, I, and the hospital said, well, that's great. Can you collect the money and select the surgeon and pay everyone too? And I said, absolutely. <laughs> and so, you know, my company that does that is inspired by Ayn Rand is Atlas Billing, you know? And so, <laughs> so they, you know, I get a check. I get a check or I, we get the cashier's check or whatever. I select the surgeon to go to that facility, otherwise the hospital administrator would have a mutiny on his hands by selecting surgeons for this stuff. And I've got great pricing. I think a robotic hysterectomy is $12,350 all in. Everything. Facility, facility, surgeon, anesthesia, pathology, and the surgeon gets, I want to say he gets two and a half times what Blue Cross would pay him to do it from Alice. Kind of in that same vein, a, a model that I'm very intrigued about, and I've, I've actually heard it from a couple of different independent surgical groups, um, I just haven't seen them follow through with it yet, but I love the model, is that is uh, that would be an independent surgical group that decides that they are going to have bundled cash pricing. But just like Dr. Smith said, they would then go out and negotiate with facilities and anesthesia on their own but they would be seen as the seller and my goodness that's that's a powerful model that's awesome that is awesome you don't happen to are you in oklahoma or texas oh. well that's close right <laughs> well and, and, and there's no reason why we can't go outside of Oklahoma and Texas so we'd be we would love to talk to you if you have some employers in your area because we do travel a little bit we've been to Pennsylvania a couple of times even though we have no business up there but hope springs eternal so I'd like to thank all three panelists today very informative uh, presentations thank you <laughs>